The Philosophy of Social Ecology Essays on Dialectical Naturalism by Murray Bookchin Published by Black Rose Books of Montreal, New York and London Freedom and Necessity in Nature, A Problem in Ecological Ethics Note number 1, this article was originally published in Alternatives, Volume 13, Number 4, November 1986. It has been significantly revised for publication here. End note. One of the most entrenched ideas in Western thought is the notion that nature is a harsh realm of necessity, a domain of unrelenting lawfulness and compulsion. From this underlying idea, two extreme attitudes have emerged. Either humanity must yield with religious or ecological humility to the dicta of natural law and take its abject place side by side with the lowly ants on which it arrogantly treads, or it must conquer nature by means of its technological and rational astuteness, in a shared project ultimately to liberate all of humanity from the compulsion of natural necessity, an enterprise that may well entail the subjugation of human by human. The first attitude, a quasi-religious quietism, is typified by deep ecology, anti-humanism and sociobiology, while the second, an activist approach, is typified by the liberal and Marxian image of an omniscient humanity cast in a commandeering posture toward the natural world. Modern science, despite its claims to value free objectivity, unwittingly takes on an ethical mantle when it commits itself to a concept of nature as comprehensible, as orderly in the sense that nature's laws are rationally explicable and basically necessitarian, the ancient Greeks viewed this orderly structure of the natural world as evidence of a cosmic noose or logos that produced a subjective presence in natural phenomena as a whole. Yet with only a minimal shift in emphasis, this same notion of an orderly nature can yield the dismal conclusion that freedom is the recognition of necessity, to use Friedrich Engels's rephrasing of Hegel's definition. In this latter case, Freedom is subtly turned into its opposite, the mere consciousness of what we can or cannot do. Such an internalized view of freedom as subject to higher dicta, of spirit, Hegel, or history, Marx, not only served Luther in his break with the Church's hierarchy, it provided an ideological justification for Stalin's worst excesses in the name of dialectical materialism and his brutal industrialization of Russia under the aegis of society's natural laws of development. It may also yield an outright Skinnerian notion of an overly determined world in which human behavior is reduced to mere responses to external or internal stimuli. These extremes aside, the conventional wisdom of our time still sees nature as a harsh realm of necessity, morally, as well as materially that constitutes a challenge to humanity's survival and well-being, not to speak of its freedom. With the considerable intellectual heritage of dystopian thinkers like Hobbes and utopian ones like Marx, the self-definition of major academic disciplines embodies this tension, indeed, this conflict. Economics was forged in the crucible of a necessitarian, even stingy nature whose scarce resources were thought to be insufficient to meet humanity's unlimited needs. Psychology, certainly in its psychoanalytic forms, stresses the importance of controlling human internal nature, with the bonus that the individual's sublimated energy will find its expression in the subjugation of external nature. Theories of work, society, behavior and even sexuality turn on an image of a necessitarian nature that must in some sense be dominated to serve human ends presumably on the old belief that what is natural disallows all elements of choice and freedom. Nor is nature philosophy itself untainted by this harshly necessitarian image. Indeed, more often than not, it has served as an ideological justification for a hierarchical society, modeled on a hierarchically structured natural order. This image and its social implications, generally associated with Aristotle, still live in our midst as a cosmic justification for domination in general, in its more noxious cases, for racial and sexual discrimination, and in its most nightmarish form, for the outright extermination of entire peoples. Raised to a moral calling, man emerges from this massive ideological apparatus as a creature to whom spirit or God has imparted a supernatural quality of a transcendental kind and a mission to govern an ordered universe that he or it created. At first glance, resolving the conflict between necessity and freedom, presumably between nature and society, seems to require building a bridge between the two, 
as in value systems that are based on purely utilitarian attitudes toward the natural world. The argument that humanity's abuse of nature subverts the material conditions for our own survival, although surely true, is nonetheless crassly instrumental. It assumes that human concern for nature rests on self-interest rather than on a feeling for the living world of which human beings are part, albeit in a very distinctive way. In such a value system our relationship with nature is neither better or worse than the success with which we plunder it without harming ourselves. It is another warrant for undermining the natural world, provided only that we can find adequate substitutes, however synthetic, simple, or mechanical, for existing life forms and ecological relationships. It is precisely this approach that has exacerbated the present ecological crisis. Moreover, Attempts to bridge the gulf between the natural and social worlds that are premised on a mechanical dualism between nature and society can indirectly preserve this dualism even as they seek to overcome it. This kind of purely structural approach has given rise to splits between body and mind, reality and thought, object and subject, country and town, and ultimately, society and the individual. It is not far-fetched to say that the primary schism between nature and humanity has nourished a wide variety of splits in everyday life as well as in our theoretical sensibilities. No less serious a fallacy is to attempt to overcome these dualisms simply by reducing one element of the duality to the other or, seriously, to attempt to dissolve humanity into nature. The universal night in which all cows are black, as Hegel phrased it in his Phenomenology of Spirit, attains unity by sacrificing the variety and the uniqueness of humanity as a remarkable product of natural evolution. Such reductionism yields a crude mechanistic spiritualism that is merely the counterpart of the prevailing mechanistic materialism. In either case, a nuanced interpretation of evolutionary phenomena that takes into account distinctions and gradations as well as continuities is replaced by a simplistic dualism that dismisses the phases that enter into any process. It embraces a simplistic and mystical oneness that overrides the immense wealth of differentia to which the present biosphere is heir, the rich, fecund constituents that make up our evolution and that are preserved in nearly all existing phenomena. It is surprising that ecology, one of the most organic of contemporary disciplines, is itself so lacking in organic ways of thinking, that is, in forms of reason that inwardly derive, or adduce, differentia from one another the full from the germinal, the complex from the simple, in short, in thinking organically and adductively, not merely deducing conclusions from hypotheses in typical mathematical fashion, or simply tabulating and classifying facts. Ecologists too often share with accountants the mode of reasoning so prevalent today, one that is largely analytical and classificatory rather than processual and developmental. Appropriate as analytical, classificatory, and deductive modes of reasoning are for assembling automobile engines or constructing buildings, they are woefully inadequate for ascertaining the phases that make up a process, each with its own integrity yet as part of an ever-developing continuum. We may well fail to understand life itself if we see life forms as little more than factors in production, as natural resources to be placed in the service of wealth, rather than as part of the creative phenomenon of life. Again, this mechanistic sensibility and its analytic mode of thought is alien to processual thought, to apprehending development and its phases, both their differences and their continuities. It is becoming a cliché to fault humanity's separation from nature as the source of alienation in our highly fragmented world. We must see that every process is also a form of alienation, in the sense that differentiation involves separation from older forms of being as well as the absorption of what is negated into the new, such that the whole is the richly varied fulfillment of its latent potentialities. Standing in marked contrast to this view of alienation as self-expression or self-articulation as well as opposition is an all-pervasive epistemology of rule that sorts difference as such, indeed, the other in all its forms into an ensemble of antagonistic relationships structured around command and obedience. That the other is at least part of a whole, however differentiated it is, eludes the modern mind in a flux of experience that knows division exclusively as conflict or breakdown. Note number 2. Despite some recent nonsense to the effect that the Frankfurt School reconnoitered a non-hierarchical and ecological view of society's future, in no sense were its ablest thinkers, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, 
resolutely critical of hierarchy and domination. Rather, their views were clearly pessimistic, reason and civilization, for better or worse, entail uncompromising individuals, who, may have been in favor of unity and cooperation, to build a strong hierarchy. The history of the old religions and schools like that of the modern parties and revolutions teaches us that the price for survival is practical involvement, the transformation of ideas into domination. See Horkheimer and Adorno, Dialectic of Enlightenment, New York, Herder and Herder, 1972, originally published in 1944, pages 213, 215. The power of these thinkers lay in their opposition to positivism and the theoretical problems they raised, not in the solutions they offered. Attempts to make them into proto-social ecologists, much less precursors of bioregionalism, involve a gross misreading of their ideas or, worse, a failure to read their works at all. End note. The real world is indeed divided antagonistically, to be remedied by struggle, reconciliation, and transcendence. But if the thrust of evolution has any meaning, it is that a continuum is processual precisely in that it is graded as well as united, a flow of derived phases as well as a shared development from the simpler to the more complex. Neither conflict nor differentiation should be permitted to override the other as the long-range character of development in nature and society. What then does it mean to speak of complexity, variety, and unity in diversity in developmental processes? Ecologists generally treat diversity as a source of ecological stability, in the belief that while the vulnerability to pests of a single crop treated with pesticides can reach alarming proportions, a more diversified crop, in which a number of plant and animal species interact, produces natural checks on pest populations. Note number 3. This approach was still rather new some 25 years ago, when I pioneered it together with rare colleagues like Charles S. Elton. Today it has become commonplace in ecological and environmental thinking, as have organic methods of gardening. End note. But the fact that biotic, and social, evolution has been marked until recently by the development of ever more complex species and eco-communities raises an even more challenging issue. The diversity of an eco-community may be a source of greater stability from an agricultural standpoint, but from an evolutionary standpoint, it may be an ever-expanding, albeit nascent source of freedom within nature, a medium for providing varying degrees of choice, self-directiveness and participation by life forms in their own development. I wish to propose that the evolution of living beings is no mere passive process, the product of exclusively chance conjunctions between random genetic changes and selective environmental forces, and that the origin of species is no mere result of external influences that determine the fitness of a life form to survive as a result of random factors in which life is simply an object of an indeterminable selective process. The increase in diversity in the biosphere opens new evolutionary pathways, indeed, alternative evolutionary directions, in which species play an active role in their own survival and change. However nascent, choice is not totally absent from biotic evolution, indeed, it increases as species become structurally, physiologically and above all neurologically more complex. As the ecological contexts within which species evolve, the communities and interactions they form, become more complex, they open new avenues for evolution and a greater ability of life forms to act self-selectively, forming the basis for some kind of choice, favoring precisely those species that can participate in ever greater degrees in their own evolution, basically in the direction of greater complexity. Indeed, species and the eco-communities in which they interact to create more complex forms of evolutionary development are increasingly the very forces that account for evolution as a whole. Participatory evolution, as I call this view, is somewhat at odds with the prevalent Darwinian or Neo-Darwinian syntheses, in which non-human life forms are primarily objects of selective forces exogenous to them. No less is it at odds with Henri Bergson's creative evolution, with its semi-mystical Elon Vital. Ecologists, like biologists, have yet to come to terms with the notion that symbiosis, not only struggle, and participation, not only competition, factor in the evolution of species. The prevalent view of nature still stresses the exclusively necessitarian character of the natural world. An immense literature, 
both artistic and scientific, stresses the cruelty of a nature that bears no witness to the suffering of life and that is indifferent to cries of pain in the struggle for existence. Cruel nature, in this imagery, offers no solace for extinction, merely an all-embracing darkness of meaningless motion to which humanity can oppose only the light of its culture and mind. Such formulations impart sophisticated ethical dimension to the natural world that is more anthropomorphic than meaningful. But even if the formulation is anthropomorphic, it bespeaks a presence in natural evolution, subjectivity and specifically human consciousness, that cannot be ignored in formulating an evolutionary theory. We may reasonably claim that human will and freedom, at least as self-consciousness and self-reflection, have their own natural history in potentialities of the natural world, in contrast to the view that they are sui generis, the product of a rupture with the whole of development so unprecedented and unique that it contradicts the gradedness of all phenomena from the antecedent potentialities that lie behind and within every processual product. Such claims are intended to underwrite our efforts to deal with the natural world as we choose, indeed, as Marx put it in the Grundriss, to regard nature merely as an object for mankind, purely a matter of utility. The dim choices that animals exercise in their own evolution should not be confused with the will and degree of intentionality that human beings exhibit in their social lives. Nor is the nascent freedom that is rendered possible by natural complexity comparable to the ability of humans to make rational decisions. The differences between the two are qualitative, however much they can be traced back to the evolution of all animals. Our tendency to ignore the close interaction between evolving life forms and the environmental forces that select them for survival is a mechanistic prejudice that still clings to evolutionary theory. All anti Cartesian protestations to the contrary, we still view non human life forms as little more than machines or inert beings. Structurally, we may fill them out with protoplasm, but operationally, we impute no more meaning to them than to mechanical devices, a judgment, it is worth noting that is not without economic utility in dealing with working people as hands or operatives. Despite the monumental nature of his work, Darwin did not fully organicize evolutionary theory. He brought a profound evolutionary sensibility to the origin of species, but in the minds of his acolytes, species still stood somewhere between inorganic machines and mechanically functioning organisms. No less significant are the empirical origins of Darwin's own work which are deeply rooted in the Lockean atomism that nourished 19th-century British science as a whole. Allowing for the nuances that appear in all great books, the origin of species accounts for the way in which individual species originate, evolve, adapt, survive, change, or pay the penalty of extinction as if they were fairly isolated from their environment. In that account, any one species stands for the world of life as a whole in isolation from the life forms that normally interact with it and with which it is interdependent. Although predators depend upon their prey, to be sure, Darwin portrays the strand from ancestor to descendant in lofty isolation, such that early Eohippus rises, step by step, from its plebeian estate to attain the aristocratic grandeur of a sleek race horse. The paleontological diagramming of bones from former missing links to the culminating beauty of Equus caballus more closely resembles the adaptation of Robinson Crusoe from an English seafarer to a self-sufficient island dweller than the reality of a truly emerging being. This reality is contextual in an ecological sense. The horse lived not only among its predators and food but in creatively interactive relationships with a great variety of plants and animals. It evolved not alone but in ever-changing eco-communities, such that the rise of Equus caballus occurred conjointly with that of other herbivores that shared and maintained their grasslands and even played a major role in creating them. The string of bones that traces Eohippus to Equus is evidence of the succession of eco-communities in which the ancestral animal and its descendants interacted with other life forms. One could more properly modify the origin of species to read as the evolution of eco-communities as well as the evolution of species. Note number 4, Darwin did not deny the role of animal interactivity in evolution, particularly in the famous chapter 3 of The Origin of Species, where he suggests that ever-increasing circles of complexity check populations that, left uncontrolled, would reach pest proportions but he sees this as a battle within battles which must be continually recurring with varying success, on p. 58 of the modern library edition. 
Moreover, the dependency of one organic being on another, typically as of a parasite on its prey, is secondary to the struggle between individuals of the same species, page 60. Like most Victorians, Darwin had a strongly providential and moral side to his character, we may console ourselves, he assures us, that the war of nature is generally prompt, and that the vigorous, the healthy, and the happy survive and multiply, page 62. Indeed, how fleeting are the wishes and efforts of man! How short his time! And consequently how poor will be his results, compared with those accumulated by nature's productions during whole geological periods, can we wonder, then, that nature's productions should be far truer than man's productions, that they should be infinitely better adapted to the most complex conditions of life, and should plainly bear the stamp of a far higher workmanship. Page 66 These remarks do not make Darwin an ecologist but are marvelous asides to a thesis that emphasizes variation, selection, fitness, and above all struggle. Yet one cannot help but be entranced by a moral sensibility that would have been magnificently responsive to the message of modern ecology and that deserves none of the onerous rubbish that has been imputed to the man because of social Darwinism. End note. Indeed, placing the community in the foreground of evolution does not deny the integrity of species, their capacity for variation, or their unique lines of development. Species become vital participants in their own evolution, active beings not merely passive components, taking full account of their nascent freedom in the natural process. Nor are will and reason sui generis. They have their origins in the growing choices conferred by complexity and in the alternative pathways opened up by the growth of complex eco-communities and the development of increasingly complex neurological systems, in short, processes that are both internal and external to life forms. To speak of evolution in very broad terms tends to conceal the specific evolutionary processes that make up the overall process. Many anatomical lines of evolution have occurred, the evolution of the various organs that freed life forms from their aquatic milieu, of eyes, and ears, which sophisticated their awareness of the surrounding environment, and of the nervous system, from nerve networks to brains. Thus, mind too has its evolutionary history in the natural world and as the neurological capability of life forms to function more actively and flexibly increases, so too does life itself help create new evolutionary directions that lead to enhanced self-awareness and self-activity. Selfhood appears germinally in the communities that life forms establish as active agents in their own evolution, contrary to conventional evolutionary theory. Does the nature of evolution warrant introducing a presiding agent into evolutionary and ecological theory? one that predetermines the development of life forms along the lines I have described, a spirit, God, mind, or perhaps a semi-mystical Bergsonian Elon Vital. I think not, if only because the concept of such a hidden hand preserves the nature-society dualism itself. So profoundly does dualism inhere in our mental operations that when we consider the imminent striving of life forms toward various degrees of freedom and self-awareness, we often slip into explanations involving supernature rather than nature itself, reductionism rather than differentiation, and succession rather than culmination. Hence the present revival of the reverence for nature that the 19th century romantic tradition so poetically cultivated, a revered natural world dissolved into a mystical oneness. Not only does this reverence preserve and even foster a nature-society dualism, it restores to evolutionary theory the very dualism that underpins hierarchy and the view of all differentiation as degrees of domination and subordination. A revered nature is a separated nature in the bad sense of the term, that is to say, a mystified nature. Like the deities that human beings create in their imagination and worship in temples, mediated by priests and gurus with their incantations and rituals, this separated nature becomes a reified and contrived phenomenon that is set apart from the human world, even as human beings genuflect before a mystified, it. Reverence for nature, the mythologizing of the natural world, degrades it by denying nature its universality as that which exists everywhere, free of dualities like spirit and God. If liberal and Marxist theorists prepared the ideological basis for plundering the natural world, Biocentrically oriented anti-humanists and natural law devotees may be preparing the ideological basis for plundering the human spirit. In the course of revering nature, 
they have created an insidious image of a humanity whose intrinsic worth is no more or less than that of other species. Biocentrism denies humanity its real place in natural evolution by completely subordinating humanity to the natural world. Paradoxically, biocentrism and anti-humanism also contribute to the alienation and reification of nature such that a reverence for nature can easily be used to negate any existential respect for the diversity of life. Against the background of a cosmic nature, human life and individuality are completely trivialized, as witness James Lovelock's description of people as merely intelligent fleas feeding on the body of Gaia. Nor can we ignore a growing number of natural law acolytes who advocate authoritarian measures to control population growth and forcibly expel urban dwellers from large congested cities as though a society that is structured around the domination of human by human could be expected to leave the natural world intact. It is grossly misleading to invoke biocentrism, natural law and anti-humanism for ends that deny the most distinctive of human natural attributes, the ability to reason, to foresee, to will, and to act insightfully to enhance nature's own development. In a sense, it deprecates nature to separate these subjective attributes from it as though they did not emerge out of evolutionary development and were not implicitly part of animal development. A humanity that has been rendered oblivious to its own responsibility to evolution, a responsibility to bring reason and the human spirit to evolutionary development, to foster diversity, and to provide ecological guidance such that the harmful and the fortuitous in the natural world are diminished is a humanity that betrays its own evolutionary heritage and that ignores its species' distinctiveness and uniqueness. Ironically, then, a nature that is reverentially hypostatized is a nature set apart from humanity, and in the very process of being hypostatized over humanity, it is defamed. A nature reconstructed into forms apart from itself, however reverentially, easily becomes a mere object of utility. Indeed, a revered nature is the converse of the old liberal and Marxian image of nature dominated by man. Both attitudes reinstate the theme of domination in ecological discussion. Here the limited form of reasoning based on deduction, so commonplace in conventional logic, supplants an organismic form of reasoning based on adduction, that is, on derivation, so deeply rooted in the dialectical outlook. Potentially, human reason is an expression of nature rendered self-conscious, a nature that finds its voice in being of its own creation. It is not only we who must have our own place in nature but nature that must have its place in us, in an ecological society and in an ecological ethics based on humanity's catalytic role in natural evolution. Along with the anti-humanistic ideologies that foster misanthropic attitudes and actions, the reduction of human beings to commodities is steadily denaturing and degrading humanity. The commodification of humanity takes its most pernicious form in the manipulation of the individual as a means of production and consumption. Here, human beings are employed, in the literal sense of the term, as techniques either in production or in consumption, as mere devices whose creative powers and authentic needs are equally perverted into objectified phenomena. As a result, we are witnessing today not only the fetishization of commodities, to use Marx's famous formulation, but the fetishization of needs. Note number 5. See Murray Bookchin, The Ecology of Freedom, Palo Alto, Cheshire Books, 1982, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1991, pages 68 to 69. End note. Human beings are becoming separated from their own nature as well as from the natural world in an existential split that threatens to give dramatic reality to Descartes' theoretical split between the soul and the body. In this sense, the claim that capitalism is a totally unnatural order is only too accurate. The terrible tragedy of the present social era is not only that it is polluting the environment, it is also simplifying natural eco-communities, social relationships, and even the human psyche. The pulverization of the natural world is being accompanied by the pulverization of the social and psychological worlds. In this sense, the conversion of soil into sand in agriculture can be said, in a metaphorical sense, to apply to society and the human spirit. The greatest danger we face apart from nuclear immolation, is the homogenization of the world by a market society and its objectification of all human relationships and experiences into commodities. 
To recover human nature is not only to recover its continuity with the creative process of natural evolution but to recognize its distinctiveness. To conceive of the participation of life forms in evolution is to understand that nature is a realm of incipient freedom. It is freedom and participation, not simply necessity, that we must emphasize, an emphasis that involves a radical break with the conventional image of nature. Social ecology, in effect, stands at odds with the notion that culture has no roots whatever in natural evolution. Indeed, it explores the roots of the cultural and the natural and seeks to ascertain the gradations of biological development that phase the natural into the social. By the same token, it also tries to explore the important differences that distinguish the societal from the natural and to ascertain the gradations of social development that, hopefully, will yield a new, humanistic ecological society. The two lines of exploration go together in producing a larger whole, indeed, one that must transcend even the present capitalist society based on perpetual growth and profit. To identify society as such with the present society, to see in capitalism an emancipatory movement precisely because it frees us from nature, is not only to ignore the roots of society in nature but to identify a perverted society with humanism and thereby to give credence to the anti-humanist trends in ecological thinking. This much is clear, the way we view our position in the natural world is deeply entangled with the way we organize the social world. In large part, the former derives from the latter and serves, in turn, to reinforce social ideology. Every society projects its own perception of itself onto nature, whether as a tribal cosmos that is rooted in kinship communities, a feudal cosmos that originates in and underpins a strict hierarchy of rights and duties, a bourgeois cosmos structured around a market society that fosters human rivalry and competition, or a corporate cosmos diagrammed in flow charts, feedback systems, and hierarchies that mirror the operational systems of modern corporate society. That some of these images reveal a truthful aspect of nature, whether as a community or a cybernetic flow of energy, does not justify the universal, almost imperialistic claims that their proponents stake out for them over the world as a whole. Ultimately, only a society that has come into its truth, to use Hegelian language, a rational and ecological society, can free us from the limits that oppressive and hierarchical societies impose on our understanding of nature. The power of social ecology lies in the association it establishes between society and ecology, in understanding that the social is, potentially at least, a fulfillment of the latent dimension of freedom in nature, and that the ecological is a major organizing principle of social development. In short, social ecology advances the guidelines for an ecological society. The great divorce between nature and society, or between the biological and the cultural, is overcome by shared developmental concepts such as greater diversity in evolution, the wider and more complete participation of all components in a whole, and the ever more fecund potentialities that expand the horizon of freedom and self-reflexivity. Society, like mind, ceases to be sui generis. Like mind, with its natural history, Social life emerges from the loosely banded animal community to form the highly institutionalized human community. Note number 6. An ecological approach can spare us some of the worst absurdities of sociobiology and biological reductionism. The popular notion that our deep-seated reptilian brain is responsible for our aggressive, brutish, and cruel behavioral traits may make for good television dramas like Cosmos, but it is ridiculous science. Like all the great animal groups, most Mesozoic reptiles were almost certainly gentle herbivores, not carnivores, and those that were carnivores were probably neither more nor less aggressive, brutish, or cruel than mammals, are images of Tyrannosaurus rex, a creature whose generic name is sociological nonsense, may be inordinately frightening, but they grossly distort the reptilian life forms on which the carnivore preyed. If anything, the majority of Mesozoic reptiles were probably very pacific and easily frightened, all the more because they were not particularly intelligent vertebrates. What remains unacknowledged in this imagery of fierce, fire-breathing, and unfeelingly cruel reptiles is the implicit assumption of different psychic sensibilities in reptiles and mammals, the latter presumably being more sensitive and understanding than the former. 
A psychic evolution in non-human beings thus goes together with the evolution of intelligence. Yet confronted with the unstated premises of such evolutionary trends, few scientists would find them comfortable. End note. Social ecology challenges the image of an unmediated natural evolution, in which the human mind, society and even culture are sui generis, in which non-human nature is irretrievably separated from human nature, and in which an ethically defamed nature finds no expression whatever in society, mind and human will. It seeks to throw a critical and meaningful light on the phased, graded and cumulative development of nature into society, richly mediated by the prolonged dependence of the human young on parental care by the blood tie as the earliest social and cultural bond beyond immediate parental care, by the so-called sexual division of labor, and by age-based status groups and their role in the origin of hierarchy. Ultimately, it is the institutionalization of the human community that distinguishes society from the non-human community, whether for the worse, as in the case of pre-1789 France or Tsarist Russia, where weak. Unfeeling tyrants like Louis XVI and Nicholas II were raised to commanding positions by bureaucracies, armies and social classes, or for the better, as in forms of self-governance and management that empower the people as a whole, like the Parisian sections during the French Revolution and the anarcho-syndicalist collectives during the Spanish Civil War. We see no such contrived institutional infrastructures in non-human communities, although the rudiments of a social bond do exist in the mother, offspring relationship and in common forms of mutual aid. With a growing knowledge that sharing, cooperation and concern foster healthy human consociation, with the technical disciplines that open the way for a creative metabolism between humanity and nature, and with a host of new insights into the presence of nature in so much of our own civilization, it can no longer be denied that nature is still with us. Indeed, it has returned to us ideologically as a challenge to the devouring of natural resources for profit and the mindless simplification of the biosphere. We can no longer speak meaningfully of a new or rational society without also tailoring our social relationships and institutions to the eco-communities in which our social communities are located. In short, any rational future society must be an ecological society, conjoining humanity's capacity for innovation, technological development and intellectuality with the non-human natural world on which civilization itself rests and human well-being depends. The ecological principles that enter into biotic evolution do not disappear from social evolution, any more than the natural history of mind can be dissolved into Kant's historical epistemology. Quite the contrary, the societal and cultural are ecologically derivative, as the men's and women's houses in tribal communities so clearly illustrate. The relationship between nature and society is a cumulative one, while each remains distinctive and creative in its own right. Perhaps most significant, the nature of which the societal and cultural are derivative, and cumulative, is a nature that is a potential realm of freedom and subjectivity, and humanity is potentially the most self-conscious and self-reflexive expression of that natural development. Social ecology, by definition, takes on the responsibility of evoking, elaborating and giving an ethical content to the natural core of society and humanity. Note number 7. This project is elaborated in considerable detail in my book The Ecology of Freedom. End note. Granting the limitations that society imposes on our thinking, the development of mind out of first nature produces an objective ground for an ethics, indeed for formulating a vision of a rational society that is neither hierarchical nor relativistic, an ethics that is based neither on atavistic appeals to blood and soil and inexorable social laws, dialectical or scientific, on the one hand, nor on the wayward consensus of public opinion polls, which will support capital punishment. One year in life imprisonment the next. Freedom becomes a desideratum as self-reflexivity, as self-management, and most excitingly, as a creative and active process that, with its ever-expanding horizon, resists the moral imperatives of a rigid definition and the jargon of temporally conditioned biases. Note number 8. Hence freedom is no longer resolvable into a strident nihilistic negativity or a trite instrumental positivity. Rather, in its open-endedness, it contains both and transcends them as a continuing process. Freedom thus resists precise definition just as it resists terminal finality. 
it is always becoming, hopefully surpassing what it was in the past and developing into what it can be in the future. End note. An ecological ethics of freedom would provide an objective directiveness to the human enterprise. We have no need to degrade nature or society into a crude biologism at one extreme or a crude dualism at the other. A diversity that nurtures freedom, an interactivity that enhances complementarity, a wholeness that fosters creativity, a community that strengthens individuality, a growing subjectivity that yields greater rationality, all are desiderata that provide the ground for an objective ethics. They are also the real principles of any graded evolution, one that renders not only the past explicable but the future meaningfully. An ecological ethics of freedom cannot be divorced from a technics that enhances our relationship with nature, a creative, not destructive, metabolism with nature. Human beings must be active agents in the biosphere, vividly, expressively, and rationally, not retreat into the passive animism of pagan, Taoist, and Buddhist mystics who recycle Asian philosophies and sensibilities through the ashrams and religious temples of the Pacific Rim of the United States. But it makes all the difference in the world if we cultivate food not only on behalf of our physical well-being but with regard for the well-being of the soil as well. Inasmuch as agriculture is always a culture, the differences in the methods and intentions involved are no less cultural than a book on engineering. Yet in the first case, our intentions are informed by economic considerations, at best, and greed, at worst, in the second, by an ecological sensibility. Society must recover the plasticity of the organic in the sense that every dimension of experience must be infused with an ecological, a dialectical sensibility. There is a profoundly ethical dimension to the attempt to bring soil, flora, and fauna, or what we neatly call the food chain, into our lives, not only as wholesome sources of food but as part of a broad movement in which consumption is no less a creative process than production, originating in the soil and returning to it in a richer form all the components that make up the food cycle. So, too, in the production of objects it makes all the difference in the world if craftspeople work with a respect for their materials, emphasizing quality and artistry in production rather than mass-producing commodities with no concern for handling materials sparingly let alone for human needs. In the former, production and consumption go beyond the pure economic domain of the buyer-seller relationship, indeed, beyond the domain of mere material sustenance, and enter into the ecological domain as a mode of enhancing the fecundity of an eco-community. An eco-technology, for consumption no less than production, serves to enrich an ecosystem just as compost and food cultivation enriches the soil rather than degrading and simplifying the natural fundament of life. An eco-technology is thus a moral technology, a technology that stands at odds with gigantism, waste, and the mass destruction wrought on the environment by capitalistic forms of technology designed purely for profit. The choices we make in these respects, in the food we grow and eat, in the objects we produce and consume, are between an ecological alternative and a purely economic one. We are profoundly influenced by social institutions, whichever alternative we choose. In the end, our choice will be between an eco-community or a market community, between a society infused by life or a society infused by gain. Yet no rational society can hope to exist, still less stabilize itself, without amply meeting human needs and providing the free time to create a fully democratic polity. The advances in technology that mark the past few centuries cannot be dismissed exclusively because of the damage they have inflicted both on the natural world and on the human condition. For now we can at least choose the kind of world in which we want to live, we can choose to bring science and technological knowledge to the service of humanity and the biosphere alike. To say that nature belongs in humanity just as humanity belongs in nature is to express a highly reciprocal and complementary relationship between the two instead of one structured around subordination and domination. Neither society nor nature dissolves into the other. Rather, social ecology tries to recover the distinctive attributes of both in a continuum that gives rise to a substantive ethics, wedding the social to the ecological without denying the integrity of each. The fecundity and potentiality for freedom that variety and complexity bring to natural evolution, indeed, that emerge from natural evolution, can also be said in a qualitatively advanced form to apply to social evolution and psychic development. 
The more diversified a society and its psychic life, the more creative it is, and the greater the opportunity for freedom it is likely to offer not only in terms of new choices that open up to human beings but also in terms of the richer social background that diversity and complexity create. As in natural evolution, so too in social evolution we must go beyond the image that diversity and complexity yield greater stability, the usual claim that ecologists make for the two, and emphasize that they yield greater creativity, choices, and freedom. At the same time there can be no return to the past, to the domestic realm, to the age ranks, or to the kinship relationships of tribalism. Nor can there be a return to the myths, amulets, magical practices, and idols, female or male, of the past. While we redeem what is valuable in pre-modern societies for enhancing human solidarity and an ecological sensibility, we must also transcend all the parochial and divisive features of the past and present. If we are to create a truly rational and ecological society, we must nourish the insights provided by reason to create a sense of a shared humanity that is bound neither by gendered outlooks nor by beliefs in deities, all of which, ironically, are merely anthropomorphic projections of our own beings and sensibilities, as Ludwig Feuerbach so clearly saw, and we must commit ourselves to a belief in the potentialities of humanity to foresee and understand, to be the embodiment of mind. No ecological ethics of freedom can be divorced from a politics of participation, a politics that fosters self-empowerment rather than state empowerment. Such a politics must become a truly peopled politics in the sense that political participation is literally peopled by assemblies and by face-to-face -face discussion. The political ethics that follows from this ground is meant to create an ethical community, not simply an efficient one, an ecological community, not simply an environmentally hygienic one, a social and political praxis that yields freedom, not a statist culture that merely allows a measure of public assent. If history is a bloody slaughter bench, the blood that covers it is not only that of civilization's innocent victims but that of the angry men and women who have left us a legacy of freedom. The legacy of freedom and the legacy of domination have often been tragically intermingled. If we are to rescue ourselves from the homogenizing effects of a market society, it is necessary that humanity's waning memory of heroic struggles to achieve freedom be rescued from this society's pollution, a process that has already gone far in contemporary culture.